Hello everyone. Uh, over the past few topics we've been dealing almost exclusively with indigenous cosmovisions and we've been trying to see past Spanish misinterpretations and reconstructions to see if we can understand something about what existed prior to the Spanish arrival. Now certainly in the past couple of sessions we've been seeing Christian influences coming out more and more in the text. Actually that's true for all of them really because we've gone back and had a look at the Popol Vuh as well. Now for this week that's actually quite a good thing because this time we're looking at the methodology of the first Spanish missionaries to reach the Americas. So roughly speaking I'm talking about between the years 1492 and 1565 to 70 or an actual fact really because we'll be focusing mostly on Mexico and I'll explain that shortly. Uh, we're looking at 1523 to then 1570. And what we'll be focus on, focusing on particularly is that highly creative mix of cultures that took place as a result of these early evangelization efforts. And that's what we'll finish with, really. Now, because we'll be talking about this early period, for the most part, we'll be talking about the evangelization in Mexico, as I say, because in Peru there's a rather different situation, which I'll explain now. Now, apart from the fact that the conquest of Peru came a decade later than the conquest of Mexico, The conquest took longer and was followed by a number of civil wars, so the trauma and chaos didn't really create the ideal con conditions for catechesis, which is uh, the teaching of uh, Catholicism or Christianity. Before we get into this though, it's important to give some very basic background with regard to what happened when, because I'm aware that some, that some of you, all of you might not be familiar with, uh, I guess, the, the history of the region. So the conquest of central Mexico, the Az, no, that's the Aztec Empire as, as it became known, took place between 1519 to 21. Add to that a couple of years to mop up and a couple more to push the frontiers even further. Always remember as well that this conquest, which eventually extended north into what's now the USA and south into Central America, so that's now Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras and Nicaragua, that was an alliance between the Spanish, who were known as the Castilteca or Castilians, the, the people from Castile, and the Tlaxcaltecs or the Tlaxcalans, who were bitter enemies of the Aztecs. We talked a bit about that in, 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 in that, the session that we, in which we discussed the, Az, uh, the Aztec Empire. And the Tlaxcaltecs or the Tlaxcalans were privileged allies of the Spaniards. The conquest of Peru, meanwhile, and that's also only possible due to indigenous alliances with the Spaniards, lasted from 1532 through to 1539, roughly. roughly. Um, some people put place it as 1536, but uh, the fighting continued until 1539. Anyway, we're still talking about a decade later than that of Mexico. But Peru suffered not only a single conquest, arguably the initial period of 1532 to 5, but it also immediately after was a significant there's a significant indigenous uprising in 1536 that's led by the then Inca Emperor Manco. And this was so serious, in fact, that the Spanish were on the brink of being annihilated. And it wasn't until 1539 that the Spanish, with the help of their indigenous allies and by I particularly uh, refer to the Huancas and the Cañaris here, they're mortal enemies of the Incas um, and they fought alongside the Spanish since the, since they first came into contact with the Spanish in actual fact um, yeah so it wasn't until 1539 that the Spanish really get, regained control over the majority of the territory so immediately after this the Spaniards began Become, begin fighting amongst themselves, believe it or not. The fa and uh, Chronicles, uh, this is Siesta de Leon, he talks about uh, how uh, the Incas in Vilcabamba, so this is the Incas who resisted the Spanish dominion, um, they lined the, lined the hills and just watched the, the Spanish just killing themselves, or killing each other rather, not killing themselves, yeah. So, 
Yeah, so there's a, there's essentially a civil war between the Spaniards. There's a faction who support Francisco Pizarro and his brothers, that, that, and then and they're against the faction who support Diego de Almagro. These are two of the partners in the initial uh, conquest expedition. And Diego de, de Almagro, uh, when he was killed, uh, that legacy passed to his son. And so this conflict lasted roughly until 1543. As I say, it's effectively another civil war following on from the trauma of the conquest, which, if you remember, followed on from a civil war in Tahuantinsuyo. And if that's not enough, the Pizarrist Almagro conflict was immediately followed in 1544 by a rebellion against the Spanish monarchy. And that's led by the last remaining Pizarro brother, Gonzalo. And he does this because the crown is trying to implement laws to bring the conquistadors under control and prevent the worst exploitation of indigenous Americans by the conquistadores. So that rebellion rumbles on until 1548 and finally ends with a major battle uh, in a place called Hakikawana, uh, after which, well, during which the majority of Spaniards who were fighting for Gonzalo deserted him and he was captured and then beheaded. So that takes us through to the late 1540s. Then in 1552, there's another Spanish rebellion against the crown led by another conquistador named Francisco Hernández Girón. And that leads, leads to the paradoxical situation or kind of ironic situation in which that rebellion is largely put down with indigenous Andeans fighting for the king of Spain against the conquistador. In the meantime, the remnants of the Incas who refused to bow to Spanish dominion, as I've just mentioned, they established themselves in the eastern Andes in a neo-Inca state called Vilcabamba, or as a region called Vilcabamba, and they established a neo-Inca state. From there, under initially under Manco Inca, until he's murdered in 1544, and then his sons, uh, particularly Inca Titucusi Upanqui, they lead guerrilla attacks on Spanish supply lines and, and, and isolated haciendas. So they're basically a thorn in the side of uh, the colonial authorities. So the point I'm trying to get at for, the, for our purposes to, in this session is that all this chaos and bloodshed among Spaniards and much between Spaniards and indigenous people really wasn't conducive to a systematic campaign of evangelization. You can't really teach spiritual things if there's all this fighting going on. And the chronicles and letters by missionaries, uh, they, they complain of this, they, they, they lament the situation. And what attempts that were made, or what we know about attempts that were made, has largely been lost to historians due to the destruction of texts and the documents in this period because of the civil wars and because of the, uh, the chaos. So while some historians have had a go at trying to reconstruct some idea, particularly from some surviving Augustinian and Dominican texts, we don't really know too much about evangelization in Peru in the period prior to 1550. Now, central Mexico, on the other hand, was quite another matter, and this period really was when Christianity became established on the ground. So what I'm going to do over the next two lecture segments is take you through, uh, firstly, the context, the historical context, and then up a particularly important co concept which is that of salvation. In the second segment I'll talk to you about a concept of millenarianism and then we'll move on to discuss the methods that the mendicant friars or the missionaries used. Okay so where do we start? Now given that this week we're talking about mendicant methods the first thing to do is clarify what the word mendicant actually refers to. Now it comes from the Latin mendicare, meaning to beg. So the Sp if you think of the Spanish for, 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 for the term for beggar, it's un mendigo. And it refers to men of particular religious orders who took vows of poverty. And in contrast to secular clergy, and by secular clergy I mean ordinary parish priests, uh, ones who, aren't, uh, who don't take these, vow these particular vows of poverty, they'd be attached to a monastery or a convent and they'd live and pray communally. 
And their ethos is never to own anything but their habit or their clothes and to live and and the clothes that they had were not they were supposed to be very poor the roughest wool um they uh, they had one habit and two tunics if this is thinking of the franciscans and they were supposed to live lives of charity by relying on it and by practicing it and they're bound by vows of obedience to their superiors but, and this is a tangential but important detail, the meaning of obedience has changed between then and now. This is something to bear in mind. So again, the word comes from Latin. Uh, the term is ob audire, meaning to listen to. And those bound by vows of obedience were obliged to listen to the reasoning of their superiors, but weren't allowed to set aside their own reason and go against their consciences. It's not about submission of the will, it's about discernment. It's about listening and using reason to decide to discern what is right. So the ideal scenario is to listen, think, and pray, and use reason to become of one mind with the superior. So if an order is stupid, not viable due to the specific context, or immoral, then they're not obliged to carry it out. And that's something we can all learn from. Anyway. The most prominent mendicant orders in the Americas in this early period uh, were the Franciscans, the Dominicans. These are the first to arrive on the continental mainland. And the Franciscans arrived in the Caribbean in 1493 in New Spain, well that's Mexico, uh, 1524, and in Peru uh, in 1531-2. The Dominicans, meanwhile, uh, arrived in the Caribbean in 1510 in New Spain, 1525 to 6 and in Peru 1531 and then you've got another important order called the Augustinians or the Augustinian order the order of St Augustine and they arrived in Mexico in 1533 and in Peru uh, they arrived a bit later in 1551 the Mercedarians meanwhile again some quite early arrivals uh, in the Caribbean they arrived in 1595 uh, sorry that's 1510 in mexico they got there right at the time of the conquest in 1519 and in peru again at the time of the conquest 1531 through to five all of these orders are founded in the medieval period and they took on important and quite varied functions within society often linked to teaching uh, so uh, education uh, what else? Health, uh, hospitals, they ran hospitals, um, charitable houses, um, etc, etc. And it's the mendicants, uh, the friars of these orders, who are given responsibility for the initial phase of evangelization in Mexico and Peru. And in part, this is because, they'd be res this, this is because they were responsible for the evangelization of the newly conquered Andalusia. And this is all important for understanding how things developed and the mentalities that they took with them. Okay, so let's move on to talk about the concepts. With, um, and the first one we're going to talk about is that of salvation. And within this we'll talk about context as well. So in this day and age, Particularly with our more relativistic worldview, we might ask, why did they bother? Why did they go to so much trouble and effort, and in some cases so cause so much pain and trauma to evangelize and try to convert people to Christianity? Well, ultimately, it all has to do with the concept of salvation. But again, this is a term that doesn't necessarily make much sense to us. Uh, I mean, we think we know what it means, but do we really know what it means? And if we followed our modern secular instincts, we might assume that salvation is just a cynical justification for conquest and an equally, if not more cynical, euphemism for colonial exploitation. So it's essentially just another word to justify conquest and enslavement. Well, let's look at that in more detail. Now, in some ways... And I say this cautiously, 
this instinct is moving along the right lines because it is very hard to separate the broader history of evangelization in the Americas from the history of the conquest and subjugation of indigenous peoples. Even some of the religious iconography of the time appears to link the spreading of Christianity with conquest by the sword. And you can see that in this image here of uh, the Virgin Mary uh, on a cloud and shooting hail or stones, hailstones uh, from her hands to rout um, the Incas besieging Cusco in 1536. Um, she's participating in the battle here. Um, but of course, this idea that religious iconography linking the spread of, con of Christianity with conquest does need some important contextualization and a lot of nuancing. So, where do we start? We've got to understand the, pers the, the perspective of the time. So non-Christian religious beliefs and practices, and especially Islam, were often considered to be diabolically inspired. So Islam itself was considered by Christians to have been developed from a heretical form of Christianity known as Nestorianism. So essentially it was considered a Christian heresy. It wasn't considered a religion apart. Um, so the centuries-old war against the, Mo the Moorish peoples in Spain, and that's often problematically called the Reconquista or the Reconquest, uh, which ended in 1492 with the fall of Granada, not surprisingly became overlaid with this religious rhetoric and fervor. The idea that uh, Islam was a heresy and uh, it was diabolically inspired. Now, in previous sessions we've talked about, talked about how Andean deities participated in, the, in their battles. Well, a similar sort of idea existed in European societies also. Religious entities, especially saints and angels, were commonly believed, well, perhaps not commonly, perhaps that's a bit of an exaggeration. Um, they were believed to ha intervene to change the course of a battle, or victories are later attributed to them at a later date. So, for example, St. Michael, who's the scourge of Satan, uh, he's, the, he's the leader of the angelic armies in, in heaven and who cast Lucifer out of heaven when, when, when he committed his first sin. Um, Saint Michael was also, also considered to be the hammer of diabolical idolatry. And so his image is ubiquitous in the con conquered territories. So here you've got an image of Saint Michael. Uh, it looks like he's pommeling uh, the devil in the form of a, well, it's hard to tell whether it's a dragon or a dog or a combination of the two. Um, usually it's a dragon um, and usually St. Michael carries uh, a sword in his hand or a, a spear, usually a sword. Um, and yeah, he's striking the devil, he's holding the devil with a chain and he's striking him down. And this refers to the first battle that the angels fought, which is also mentioned in the book of Revelation that I suggested you read. Yeah, it's just that in this in this sculpture here, which is in Granada in Spain, uh, the church of San Miguel de Albaicín, which is the Moorish quarter, the Islamic quarter of the city, he's, yeah, uh, th this image, this sculpture here, uh, it the the spear is sorry, the sword is has been broken off. We've got here an image in Oaxaca, uh, and you can see the devil down here, and he's being speared this time by uh, Saint Michael. Oaxaca is in, in southern Mexico. Um, mm -mm -mm. If we move to the Andes now, we've got a very rare image of Saint Michael again casting out the devil. And you can see his flame, the, what's left of his flaming sword here. This is a fresco in, in, the, in the cathedral of Trujillo um, on, the, on the Peruvian coast. And he's, he's standing on the devil and about to strike him with his flaming sword. But the devil in, in, in 
he's breathing fire, but he's not a dragon as such. He's he's taken the form of an indigenous dog. It's and we know this because the dog is hairless. Um, and what does that mean? Well, that means that it, it it's referring to what is indigenous. Not that it's believed that everything that is indigenous is satanic, but it's really uh, personifying in this iconography uh, what the Spaniards consider to be idolatry, or the Spaniards and, and indigenous Christians consider to be idolatry. Yeah, and here, if we move to the Far East, uh, you have Saint Michael again. Uh, his armor has changed. Uh, his clothing has changed, and now he's wearing, he he doesn't have a flaming sword so much as a flaming scimitar. Uh, and he's again, as in Revelation, he's bound the devil in chains, and he's using the blessed sacrament. Um, this is the consecrated host uh, as the weapon to do this. But note that the devil here has changed form. He's no longer a dragon. He's no longer a uh, a dog. He is a book um, from which we gather that in this particular image in Macau, the the religious writings of the of, of the locality, the Buddhist sutras, are considered to be idolatry and uh, and therefore diabolically inspired okay what do we have next um yeah more more angels participating in battles um so these are frescoes painted again in granada but to celebrate the christian victory so this is a, an allied christian victory against the turks in lepanto in 1571 and you can see here um this is a, an archangel this is saint michael himself uh, as you can see from the inscription here he who is like god um but then you've got these kind of cute little cherubs uh firing guns arrows uh here's a pike a pikeman um uh yeah and they're actually it depicted as participating in the battle here with fire uh casting spears um doo -doo -doo. and here we move on to uh saint james who the paint, who was the patron saint of Spain, is the patron saint of Spain, he became Saint James the Moor Slayer, uh, Santiago Matamoros, that's how he was known. Um, and the reason for this is that legend says he rode out on a white charger at the Black Battle of Clavijo in the 9th century, and he routed the Moorish armies uh, and effectively turned the course of history. Now, this is an image from Arequipa uh, in Peru, believe it or not where you can see saint james he's dressed not as a knight this time but as a pilgrim because that's the other form that he took no uh, because the because of the pilgrimage to to santiago in galicia in spain um and you can see his horse trampling uh, the bodies of them of, of what aren't moors actually uh, but are ottoman turks um because of the, you can see that because of the the, their headgear, their, their turbans here. Um, yeah, so if we move to Guaman Poma de Ayala, he was a uh, half, uh, half indigenous Andean, half Inca, and half Spaniard, uh, mixed race, but also a committed Christian. Uh, and he wrote a, a very important chronicle um, in, in which he depicted what he was talking about with line drawings uh, which is another reason why it's, this chronicle is really useful to us because it visualizes what he's talking about um, I mentioned before that uh, the Virgin Mary participated in the, in the siege of Cusco well according to the legends surrounding this siege so did Saint James and from Santiago Matamoros Saint James Morslayer he becomes Santiago Mataindios Saint James Indian Slayer, uh, and I put that in inverted commas uh, because I really don't like the the, the term Indians for, for various reasons. Um, but but yeah, that, that's 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 what he became known as, and you can see this very clearly here. Um, uh, Saint James is riding out on his white horse, and he's struck down um, an Inca warrior who's holding a mace here. 
And if we move to Chiapas, this is an 18th century painting, so it's a bit later on now, but we've got the two together. We've got St. Michael with his spear and St. James uh, Indian Slayer or Santiago Mata, Mata Indios um, rather than Matamoros because again you can see the, the, head, the headgear here um, together in the same painting. This is a small kind of portrait paint, a devo devotional painting um, that I came across in a museum in Chiapas. So yeah. You might then ask, well, how does this square with the idea that Christianity is the religion of love and Christ is the God of mercy? Especially when we have things like this. Uh, why would Christian saints, in particular, the merciful mother of God, Mary, because all Catholics are encouraged to pray to her so that she can intercede with her son for their sins. So basically, if you set Christ up as the judge, um, Mary is the one who will advocate for the sinners. So yeah, how do you square that with uh, imagery, ideas, uh, beliefs, realities like this? Um, we have Mary appearing like some vengeful uh, emperor from the Return of the Jedi with her hands out cast going <laughs> participate in a battle against indigenous Americans? Well, the first thing is you need to be very careful not to apply modern ideas about religion to peoples who lived more than 400 years ago. This idea of love and mercy has been changed out of all proportion, and I'll say relatively recently by developments in the 20th century. Possibly going back into the 19th, but uh, yeah. Really, we should come back to the meaning of the word salvation, because the focus in those days for Christians was on saving souls. So there's no point about talking about being nice and gentle if hundreds of thousands, possibly millions of souls in the future might be lost and damned to hell in the process. Because an eternity of torment in hell is a very big deal. So, the participation of saints like Mary in battles against indigenous peoples can be interpreted as part of divine providence. That's what that means is that this is what God wants to happen. So Mary saves the Spaniards from defeat in 1536 in Cusco because that's the only way that Christianity can take root in the Americas. If Manco had won that battle and defeated the Spaniards in Cusco, then that could have meant the end of the Spaniards in Tawantinsuyo. That's a substantial part of the South American continent. So millions of souls then living and yet to be born would then be condemned to hell in the beliefs of the time. So with that in mind, if we throw souls into the bargain, the saints participated in battles on the sides of the Spaniards, not because they favoured the Spaniards particularly, and this isn't because the Spaniards are particularly good Christians, so far from it, in fact, in Christian terms, it wouldn't be any surprise that plenty of them were considered to be going down after they died. And just as an example, I'll show you this drawing by Juan Poma de Ayala, assuming that my computer responds. Oh, come on. There we go. Um, yeah, uh, in which you have a classic representation of a hellmouth. Uh, filled with demons you've got the gatekeeper here saying come on in um, well he's, that's not exactly what he's saying but yeah I'm paraphrasing uh, and it's absolutely ram packed uh, and importantly with people from all races so you've got a Spaniard here at the forefront 
Uh, you've got an indigenous handy in here behind. You can tell because of the, of the hair, the hairstyle, the fact that it doesn't, uh, he doesn't have a beard. And then you have an an, an African Peruvian or uh, possibly uh, an African slave. Um, it's not clear. You can't tell. But yeah, people of all races, and it's ram packed. Um, essentially, Juan Pomeroy Ayala is saying lots of people here are going down. And then you might can. You might compare that to uh, this uh, very peaceful drawing of uh, the city of heaven, as he puts it, or Hanak Pacha, in which you've got the Trinity. So you've got God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, um, looking down over a completely empty city. There's nobody there at all. Um, yeah, so you get the sense of how hard, at least for Guam and Poma, it was, or at least how he considered how hard it was to, to, to actually be saved. Uh, the vast majority, he thought, was going down uh, and rather than going up. Uh, it's very, very hard to get into the kingdom of heaven. Um, yeah, uh, it's a very, very Augustinian way of looking at things in actual fact. Um, but that's another story. So yeah, the saints, Mary included, despite the fact that she is the merciful mother of God, could and did, apparently, participate in battles as an act of mercy, believe it or not. And I stress that because it does seem a bit perverse given our modern understanding of mercy and our understanding with respect to what happened materially to indigenous peoples during the conquest and afterwards. Because from this perspective, a Spanish victory would be for the indigenous people's benefit. Not because God or the saints favoured the Spanish and wanted them to enrich themselves, but because it enabled the salvation of millions of indigenous American souls, then living and yet to be born. And that's the Christian perspective of the time. But then you might you might ask, well, why worry particular? Why worry so much about saving souls? Uh, why worry about salvation? Uh, why not just worry about yourself? Where did this necessity to save other people's souls come come from? Well, in simple terms, it comes down to basic instructions in the Gospels, uh, and by the by the Gospels, I mean the New Testament section of the Bible. So, if we look, we've got Matthew sixteen twenty four. Which reads, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in actual fact, this is a reference to being prepared to die for one's faith, for the Christian faith, and a martyrdom, in fact. And this is certainly a possibility for the missionaries, not just the early missionaries, but ones in later periods as well. The point, though, is that they would die or be killed or murdered because they've borne witness to the truth with a capital T, i.e. the only truth worth knowing. Um, and that is, they're killed because they've spread the gospel. There's also Mark 6, 6 to 7, which reads, He, or that means Jesus, that's referring to Jesus, went around from village to village teaching the people. Then Jesus called the twelve to him and began to send them out two by two, giving them authority over unclean spirits. So again, bear in mind that the Christians, uh, all Christians, in fact, have an obligation to follow Jesus, uh, to take up our, our one's cross and follow him. Again, that's scriptural. Uh, they also, and if you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to do what Jesus did uh, and teach people. Christians would also believe that he sent his apostles or followers to do the same. So the mendicants that believed that they'd inherited that obligation. So the key moment for evangelization, though, it occurs at the end of the Gospels, just before the resurrected Jesus ascends into heaven. And this beca became known as the Great Commission. So we've got Mark 16, 15 to 16, which reads, And he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. So this is totally unequivocal. 
It's a direct instruction from Jesus to his disciples and therefore later generations of Christians and in particular priests and friars to travel across the world and preach. But not just preach. He's also qualifying that with the with the statement, the very, very unambiguous statement that those who are baptized will be saved, but those who don't accept will be condemned. And that uh, is a direct scriptural instruction um, for the friars to follow. And that's where we'll leave it. Uh, in the next section, we'll come back to the concept of millenarianism and what that means. And we'll talk a bit about the methods that they used uh, in the, in the so-called new world. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, now.